The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Okay, uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, and a lot of people come in in the first few minutes, but I'd, I'd like to maximize our time, so we're going to get started. Uh, welcome, everyone, to today's web panel. Uh, it's hosted by Open Communications for the Ocean, OCTO, uh, and our programs, programs of OCTO, the MPA News Newsletter, uh, the Marine Ecosystems and Management, or MEME Newsletter, openchannels.org, and the Coastal Marine Ecosystem-Based Management Tools Network, or EBM Tools Network, for short, which is co-coordinated by NatureServe. And we're going to be speaking today about the impacts of the Trump administration's proposed offshore drilling plan on marine protected areas and marine spatial planning. Um, and we have a fantastic panel with us today. So we'll show you who's who. Okay, so uh, I'm Sarah Carr. I'm uh, editor of the MEME newsletter and coordinator for the EBM Tools Network. I'm going to be moderating today. And as I said, we have four amazing panelists. We have Jay Austin with the Environmental Law Institute. He's at the ELI. He is the senior attorney ed and editor-in-chief of the Environmental Law Reporter and director of the OCEAN program. He is also director of the program on the Constitution, Courts, and Legislation, an initiative which looks at the intersection of the U.S. constitutional and environmental law and recent trends in the federal courts. We also have with us today Sarah Winter Whelan. She's the Ocean Policy Program Director at the American Littoral Society, a littoral society. Sorry, we were just discussing this. Uh, in this role, she works to translate the U.S. national ocean policy into in the water changes in how the U.S. manages and protects the oceans and our coasts. She also co-leads the Healthy Oceans Coalition, an alliance of more than 30 organizations that works to engage stakeholders in regionally initiated marine planning and national ocean policy. We also have Tim Charters. He's the Senior Director of Government and Political Affairs with the National Ocean Industries Association, NOIA. Uh, at NOIA, he coordinates legislative, educational, and political activities concerning offshore oil, natural gas, and wind energy resource issues. He's previously served as Vice President of Government and Regulata Regulatory Affairs for the National Stripper Well Association, Director of Policy Coordination for the U.S. House of Representatives Natural Resources Committee and Staff Director for the House Subcommittee on Energy and Mineral Resources. And last but not least, we have Richard Charter, who's a senior fellow with the Ocean Foundation. Richard specializes in advocacy on ocean protection issues and preventing and mitigating industrial impacts on ocean ecosystems. As co-chair of the National Outer Continental Shelf Coalition, he was involved in initiating and maintaining the 27-year congressional moratorium on offshore oil and gas leasing, which prevented new drilling along the U.S. West Coast, Atlantic Coast, Florida Gulf Coast, and Bristol Bay in Alaska. He also coordinated local support for the creation of the Gulf of the Farallons, Cordell Bank, Channel Islands, and Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuaries. So before we begin, I wanted to describe a little bit more about the purpose of the panel and how all of you as attendees can participate. So first of all, I wanted to emphasize that um, we as a country are on a very long, very uncertain, and very litigious road uh, on this issue. And as brilliant as our panelists are, they aren't fortune tellers. So we may have some questions that are educated guess types of questions for them, but um, the goal of the forum is really to provide background knowledge and an understanding of, of diverse perspectives um, so we all have more insight into things as they move forward. Um, we also know that many of you who are participating here today have tremendous expertise in this area yourselves, and we welcome both your questions and your comments throughout the discussion. You can type your questions into the question panel of the user interface, um, and then we may be able to convey some of the questions during uh, the panel as well as some of the comments. Um, I don't think we're going to be able to get to all questions and all comments, but we can include them uh, where we're able. 
Um, also, in case you have trouble telling who is speaking, I'll try and direct you as to who is speaking most of the time. But uh, also in the user interface, it does show up with names. Um, Richard is calling in um, through a special phone connection because he's in an isolated area. So when you see phone caller, um, that's Richard. Um, and then to get, yeah, go ahead. That would be me. Yes, yeah. And that's Richard, so you know his voice, too. Um, and then to get started, I'm going to share a few slides. Um, offshore oil and gas isn't my area of expertise, but um, I was going to share some information and graphics that I have found helpful um, in gaining a better understanding of this issue. And these are also um, graphics that we can come back to um, during the presentations if they're helpful. So first of all, I wanted to back up a little bit to Executive Order 13795, implementing an America First offshore energy strategy. Um, this was released in uh, early in 2017, and it does a number of things, but some of the uh, ones most pertinent today um, are that it revokes Obama's withdrawals of offshore Arctic and Atlantic areas under the Outer Continental Shelf Lands Act. Um, and this is being challenged in court. Um, it directs the Secretary of the Interior to consider revising the leasing schedules for the Outer Continental Shelf, and that's largely what brings us here today. It directs the Secretary of Commerce to refrain from designating or expanding any national marine sanctuaries without an accounting of the area's energy or mineral resource potential. Um, and it directs the Secretary of Commerce to review all national marine sanctuaries and, and marine national monuments designated or expanded within the past 10 years. Um, there were news reports that a report on this issue was provided by uh, Secretary of Commerce Ross to the White House in October. And mm -hmm. uh, actually, we'll be asking our panelists if they know any, if there's been any further progress on this, on that matter. Um, So just a, a big picture graphic. Uh, this one, which was pulled from the New York Times, um, shows areas open to new oil and gas leases under the last three administrations. Um, and we won't describe it in great detail, but um, just that what is proposed for the Trump administration was a proposal um, released in uh, January of this year, um, a new five-year plan. It's a draft of new five-year plan for oil and gas development of the U.S. Outer Continental Shelf. Um, once approved, this plan would cover 2019 to 2024 and would replace the current 2017 to 2022 five-year plan, uh, which was promulgated by the Obama administration. Um, as you can see, the new proposal opens up virtually all of the U.S. Outer Continental Shelf to oil and gas leasing. Uh, the National Marine Sanctuaries and Marine National Monuments are exempted. Um, the, this little triangle right here, along with a little dot, is uh, the Northeast Canyons and Seamounts Marine National Monument. Um, and all, there's also uh, Bristol Bay is also not being considered. Okay. Um, just uh, this is a plan, a draft plan for the timing of the leases, and I did want to cover a little bit um, about the Florida aspect. When I had first looked at this, I had thought this was related to the matter where uh, Secretary of the Interior Zinke had said that uh, Florida would not be considered for any new oil and gas leases. But this is it's not actually related to that. This is. Um, uh, related, there's a congressional moratorium on oil and gas drilling in the eastern Gulf of Mexico. Uh, that's set to expire in 2022, and then there are leases proposed beginning in 2023 and 2024. Okay. Um, again, just showing the proposed lease dates, uh, lease sale dates, excuse me, for uh, for Alaska. And then um, just a little bit of information about where we are in the proposal process for the for the um, oil and gas leasing program. So BOEM, the Bureau of Ocean Energy and Management, is developing a new national off outer continental shelf program for 2019 to 2024. This would replace the, the current 2017 to 2022 program. Uh, there was a request for information published in the Federal Register in July of last year. 
And then there's a uh, draft proposed program and notice of intent uh, came out in January 8th of this year. And then comments are due by March 9th. If anybody is interested in coming, that is your current deadline. And you can see there's several other steps. And just to emphasize that that's not the end of the process either, um, there's still even that's this current process, which is for the overall program for the, for the national leasing program. But then individual lease sales would also go through a process, uh, including public comment period. And then individual oil and gas exploration plans would also have, and drilling plans would also go through a, an approval process, as well as actual development and production uh, approval processes. Uh, the National Ocean Industries Association estimates this is about a 15 year, give or take several years uh, timeline to get from the beginning to end of this process. Um, this graphic I found useful. This is showing how governors of the various coastal states uh, are in favor or opposed to offshore drilling off their state. And then this graphic was also helpful and it shows uh, estimates, and these are, are really very rough estimates, of economically recoverable oil and gas. And so this may be something where uh, we return to, but you can see that a lot of the um, known uh, economically recovered oil and gas is in the western and central Gulf of Mexico, which is is already uh, much of which is already available for leasing. Okay, and all right, so now we're going to start with our questions. Um, I wanted to start off with one big question for a lot of us. Um, which is related to this, but not directly with, with the OCS. Um, I was wondering if any of our panelists, so we know that um, the administration is looking at downsizing or altering the regulations of some national marine sanctuaries and marine national monuments uh, to allow oil, dr oil and gas drilling. And um, there were reports that the Commerce Department provided the White House with a report on this in October of last year. Um, are you aware, are any of you aware of any further action on, on this, or is there anything that you can relate about I this? Tell you, I can tell you what we know. This is Richard Charter. Okay. Um, this report was created with taxpayer money. It's a report to Commerce Secretary Ross and it's being very closely held, but we understand that right now it's being sort of ping-ponged back and forth between the Department of Interior and the Department of Commerce as the administration asks for more information about offshore oil and gas potential uh, in particular within any of these sanctuaries. So that is all we know at this moment, and the interesting way that that relates, the Ross report, to the five-year leasing program, which is the topic today, is that the only exception on the federal OCS from inclusion in the five-year leasing program is Bristol Bay in Alaska, of course, which is a bipartisan you know, uh, decision, and then the National Marine Sanctuaries, but we don't know which ones yet because some of them are under review. So I think the concern is that any National Marine Sanctuary that might be rescinded or any part of one that might be rescinded instantly finds itself up for OCS oil and gas leasing in this five-year program, the way the two things relate, the five-year program and the Ross report. So we're obviously actually awaiting uh, an outcome on the National Marine Sanctuaries to see if drilling is going to happen in some of America's most sensitive and long protected coastal waters. Okay. Did it, any, yes. This is Jay. Um, you know, my, my impression is consistent with Richard's. I actually looked for that report in preparing for today and was surprised to find that, you know, that there don't even seem to be much information on leaks uh, or, you know, rumors about what's in it. But I've also followed fairly closely the, the uh, National Monuments process on the land side uh, and Secretary Zinke's review of, of all National Monuments, marine and land-based, which um, also similarly was under wraps for a while, then leaked to the press, and then finally was released by, by Interior in December. 
And there's sort of some tea leaves in that report. There were five, the five marine monuments, um, as opposed to sanctuaries, are being jointly reviewed by Interior and Commerce. And Zinke has some tidbits in his report about a few of those. Um, for two of the marine monuments, the Pacific Remote Islands Monument and Rose Atoll in Samoa, uh, he is recommending potential revisions to the boundaries and also relaxing restrictions on commercial fishing there, which people have argued defeats the purpose of, of monuments. Uh, similarly, for Northeast Canyons and Seamounts, he's relaxed restrictions, he's recommending relaxed restrictions on commercial fishing. So you know you can look at that and you can look at the rest of his report or, or things like the Utah monuments um, and get some idea where the Commerce Review may be headed because the trend is definitely toward reducing areas and protections for these recently uh, designated monument areas. Okay, thank you. Did anybody want to follow up on any of that? And I did want to, I had a follow-up question and I was just curious, what um, legal processes would there need to be, and maybe this is directed at Jay, uh, what legal process would there need to be for um, altering the regulations for existing sanctuaries or national monuments to allow oil and gas exploration? Well, each of these protected areas, whether it's a national marine monument or a national marine sanctuary, has gone through a rigorous, open, transparent public process, and particularly the National Marine Sanctuary Act is very clear about that. And for example, in Northern California, there's the Greater Farallons National Marine Sanctuary expansion, which took 18 years. Uh, was most of that area was actually passed by the House of Representatives, uh, and that particular sanctuary is uh, obviously one of the ones that we think the Commerce Department is focused on, and I don't mean that in a good way. Uh, and so, obviously. When you held public hearings for years and you went into local communities and listened to the people and you listened to the fishermen and you had, you know, virtually unanimous support from the stakeholders at all levels and the House had passed it, I think there will be a legal question uh, or two uh, to try to roll that back if that turns out to be the case. And also the creation of the National Marine Sanctuaries in California each one was found to be consistent under the Coastal Zone Management Act with the state's coastal plan. And so undoing it would also need to be found consistent. So I think there's probably six or seven layers of litigation if, if something were to happen there in terms of a rollback. Okay. Did anyone and have anything to I, I, I can speak more to the monument side than the sanctuaries. I'm more familiar with that than the Sanctuaries Act. but. Uh, there's, there are additional quirks when you're talking about the monuments because those are governed by the Antiquities Act of 1906, which as its name suggests, is itself sort of an antique, uh, very terse act, very little legislative history written a long time ago, but you know, extensive history and extensive use in designating first land-based monuments and then much more recently the marine monuments. That's, that's in the middle of a bunch of controversy right now and some open legal questions that are going to get tested. And again, I think the Utah reductions to, to Bears Ears and uh, Grand Staircase Escalante, that's going to be the crucible where these legal principles are defined because the act gives the president power to designate monuments, which again, there's a long history of, the, of that use. It's, it is silent about whether a president can then completely revoke monuments and no president has ever completely abolished something that their predecessor president has established. There's also an issue about whether they can then reduce the size um, or add or relax restrictions that were in the monument proclamations. That has been done in the past, but again, the question of whether the act authorizes it is still open. So the Utah change is so significant that it immediately generated lawsuits from environmental groups and tribes and some of these questions are going to get tested for the first time in, in more than 100 years and those that that in turn may establish the principles or establish how far the administration is willing to try to go with the marine monuments as well okay all right thank you jay um then we're going to move on add, to, yes please this is tim i just wanted to add one thing onto that it, it, it's a uh, the, the monuments discussion is really an interesting thing because this is the first time that you've seen a White House um, and a president who has actively said that they are willing to forego the executive power granted to them by 
by the laws in a sense by undoing presidential actions um and and it is as jay said it is something that is going to be tested out in court fairly extensively um but it is really in in very interesting you know theoretical executive action where a president is giving away essentially not only his own presidential power but the presidential power of those before him so um it's really it's really it's it's going to be entertaining to see how the courts settle it all out and okay. i would just quickly add to that that the important thing i think for many of these areas quote under review is that they have become, not only did they have bipartisan support in their creation, and in many cases, the creation that extended well back into the Bush administration. Uh, it, it's not just about undoing what President Obama did. These folks are reaching now back into undoing things that Ronald Reagan supported. But they had not only bipartisan support, but in National Marine sanctuaries like Thunder Bay, for example, also under review, uh, and greater feral lines, they've become fully integrated into the regional economy. So this is going to cost jobs. And that really puts the administration in kind of an embarrassing position of, you know, fighting job creation in these communities where, which have become dependent. And that, of course, led to the announcement in the Tallahassee airport by Interior Secretary Ryan Sinke explaining to Rick Scott why he was going to take Florida off the table of the OCS program was that was the economy. So I think that applies as well to the, especially to the National Marine Sanctuaries under review. Okay, um, thank you guys. And we're gonna change gears and I actually am gonna direct this question initially at Tim. Um, and so um, politics aside as much as possible, I was curious what areas does the oil and gas industry uh, find most attractive for exploration and drilling in terms of how much gas and oil there are, um, how easy it is to extract transportation issues, post removal. Um, I was curious what areas are of, of most interest. Um, so I think, I mean, obviously, you know, the, the idea to, to look at all the areas that is proposed by the president is, in, is intriguing. There are certainly areas I, I think that industry is more prepared to move forward for, both, both from an infrastructure standpoint and, and both in a resource standpoint. I think when you look at um, the eastern Gulf of Mexico is, is probably the most perspective there, both from infrastructure and from uh, sort of a knowledge base of what may be, may be available. Um, you know, further beyond that, when you start looking at areas like California, where you again you have infrastructure in place, um, where you have a market demand that is is significant, um, I think that's an area that provides a significant um, opportunity. Um, you know, industry has looked at some of the mega discoveries off of the the northern coast of Alaska, and that that clearly remains a, a priority area to to examine. And then you know, um, the Mid Atlantic and and in some ways, the North Atlantic, at least for the gas resources, um, provide a, an intriguing um, opportunity, at least, uh, to examine. Now, again, we haven't, you know, we haven't looked, you know, the Atlantic in specific, we haven't looked in, in generations. Um, and what may or may not be there, what may or may not be producible is, uh, is something that, um, you know, it's going to take some time to figure out what's actually there once the process starts rolling. So um, it's, it's hard to tell. Okay, thank you, Tim. Did anybody have again, anything it, they want? Okay. Uh, the only thing I was going to add to that is, I mean, the church you have up here kind of shows that, right? I mean, the areas that we've looked, the areas that we've explored, you've had significant discoveries and you've grown your resource base significantly. The areas where you've not looked and, and have not, you know, examined the, the resource base is much smaller, so. Okay, so you're saying the size of the circles is still uh, some degree the, the related to the exploration that's gone on there. It's a function of how much it's been explored. Correct. Gotcha. Okay. Correct. Um, did anybody want to follow up on anything Tim said? Well, I okay. would just uh, summarize. You know, this all happens under the Outer Continental Shelf Lands Act, OCS Lands Act, and there's an element of that called critical balancing, in which the Secretary is charged, Secretary of Interior is charged with balancing the relative environmental sensitivity and economic productivity. Uh, and weighing that against the potential resource uh, available and region by region as well as among the regions. And that, I think, is is a process that's proven over the time we've had the Outer Continental Shelf Lands Act. Uh, and 
I believe that what we've, we are seeing instead, and without getting into the politics of it, is the five-year program being used to choose favorites in Florida, for example. And I think that slide you showed earlier, which governors suppose they want to opt out of the five-year program, was triggered by the use of the five-year program as sort of a political uh, tool, if you will, to play favorites in Florida. And so now everybody wants similar treatment. And I think that's unfortunate and entirely illegal. So, you know, it's not just about economically recoverable oil and gas. It's also about other resources there. Uh, you know, and the North Atlantic was mentioned, for example, and that's a fishery on the way back, we hope. So you have to think about all of the elements that the ocean provides to us. Yeah, this is Sarah. I would like to maybe just build on what Richard was saying in the sense that you know, along with thinking about the resources, you know, that graphic that you put up, Sarah, about the states and how they feel about expanding potentially into offshore oil and gas. If you look, I mean, I um, find myself right up there in the North Atlantic in Massachusetts. And, um, you know, my organization is based in New Jersey. So I, you know, get a sense of a lot of the feeling happening along the Eastern seaboard. and taking into account that more than 140 cities and towns along the coast have passed, you know, municipal resolutions saying that they oppose offshore drilling or seismic testing for oil and gas, um, you know, that plays into it well in a very real way into this decision making. So I just wanted to point that out as well. Okay, well, I had two uh, points I wanted to follow up on. Um, one was about state waters. So presumably any pipelines um, bringing oil onshore will pass through state waters. Do um, any, the, the governor's opposition to oil and gas drilling, will that influence whether um, oil and gas can be brought onshore in the most efficient manner? Has good that question. happened in the past? Absolutely good question. As you know, uh, most states, state waters extend three miles from shore certain Gulf states nine miles from shore uh, in the Gulf, except for the Gulf Coast of Florida, which has nine miles from shore in the Gulf. Most of those states support drilling. But as you look at the opposition from governors, uh, you have a problem in terms of transiting uh, potentially anything across state waters, building any kind of processing facilities in state waters or on land. I mean, in California, in the mid 80s, 24 local communities adopted local onshore facilities ordinances, uh, which either ban outright or put to a vote of the local people, any onshore facilities for offshore oil and gas. And those were challenged in court by the oil industry and all of them survived. And so uh, the question is, if you drill off of California, are you gonna bring it ashore in Mexico or Canada? And I think that's a real question that's emerging in many of these states where you see the governor, the attorney general, and the senators and house members aligning against the five-year program is they could make life very difficult for any drilling in federal waters. Did anybody wanna add anything? I, I wouldn't, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't disagree that the states can make bringing pipelines in and other infrastructure ashore very challenging. There are, there are obviously um, ways that, that industry can do, can, can do that. Um, you know, modern technology also allows floating production uh, directly to ships, which again, California currently gets roughly 55% of its oil from foreign sources by ship. And so, you know, the ability to bring shiploads of oil ashore uh, that may be produced offshore, um, you know, could be a, a solution that may be done to solve that should California move to actually development um, offshore. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Tim. Understood. And of course, lightering introduces the whole risk of spills from tankers, spills from floating production. So that's another element of risk that adds in. But I, I agree with what Tim says. Yeah. But okay. again, California is 55% dependent on tanker carried oil right now. And the choice isn't you know, oil or no oil, the chase is where is that oil being produced from? And, and obviously we would prefer it being produced from by the people of California for the people of California, as opposed to the roughly $5 billion that was purchased from Saudi Arabia in 2016 by the state of California. So. Okay. Um, 
and I wanted to move on to my other question, which was about uh, exploration um, and seismic activity. Um, so I was a little confused in all my reading. Is seismic activities in starting now? Did something change with the executive order um, or, or any of the executive orders from 2017 on? Um, what, can, what can we look for in terms of seismic exploration for oil and gas in, in the next few years? Well, there is a mention of it in the executive order of April 28th, but there's also legislation uh, not yet taken up in the House of Representatives that would essentially gut the Marine Mammal Protection Act, a uh, very important piece of legislation, and gut it for the purpose of making seismic permitting, uh, permits for seismic air gun testing, for gathering information about offshore oil and gas, uh, make those permits almost a rubber stamp. In other words, six permits were pending for the Atlantic coast, for example, under the Obama administration, and this uh, incidental harassment uh, permit for there's always some incidental take of marine mammals uh, is basically now uh, proposed at least by certain members of the House of Representatives. It has not moved yet in the House. It's called the Sea Act, uh, not going anywhere yet. But it, were that to pass, you could see seismic surveys off the Atlantic coast almost immediately because the permitting and the concern about marine mammals would be taken away as well as the concern about fisheries. So we're, we're tracking that very carefully. Okay, did anyone have anything they wanted to add to this? I would I would highlight that that there have been applications for permits for seismic in the Atlantic for almost the entire Obama administration, um, which were held up um, essentially for no reason uh, to not issue and in, in, in essentially no legitimate reason was held you know, have simply been held up and and the effort by the sea act which i would characterize differently um is to um require the agencies to actually process permits in a timely fashion um understanding the actual impacts and and measuring the impacts um on species um for what they are um you know and again seismic is the foundation of what helps us understand both the resource and what you know, may or may not be perspective, and so that is the the first step for simply an understanding of 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 that of, of what may or may not be there. And again, um, folks are looking at the Atlantic and hopefully going to get permits to to um, explore the Atlantic at least seismically soon. And so, just to uh, extrapolate, so the the seismic exploration, the, the permitting to do that is not really tied to the leasing. You don't need to bid on a lease to um, be able to conduct seismic exploration? Well, seismic no. actually gives the companies the information they need uh, when you have, let's say, 47 lease sales in all four OCS regions proposed, 25 of the 26 planning areas lease sales are proposed. Uh, of those, uh, seven are in the Pacific region, nine of those lease sales are the Atlantic region. So the, the region, the companies need seismic to make decisions about where to focus their uh, areas of interest. And that, I think, is seen as a precursor activity, obviously, to offshore oil and gas leasing and why so many of the coastal communities and coastal businesses on the Atlantic are extremely concerned about seismic, is it will lead to inevitably offshore drilling by helping the industry focus where they want to drill. Okay. But I would add on, I mean, seismic doesn't come, I mean, seismic is expensive and, and the companies that produce it have to have a client that wants to buy it. And so, you know, you really don't shoot seismic, shoot seismic unless you know that somebody's going to want to buy it and, and folks are only going to look to buy it if they have a potential of, of, of leasing that area at some time in the future. Um, I think there are some folks who are putting some money into something that they may or may not get paid back on um, later on. Um, but again, it is, it is the first step, but again, the, the flip side of that is, 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 is knowing what resources are out there, knowing where those resources are helps us in an effort to understand where, where we, where, where we want to, or where we don't want to go. Uh, I mean, if we shoot modern seismic and come back with giant zeros on the Atlantic, um, you know, this entire conversation becomes, becomes moot because there's no interest, right? Now, the flip side is, is if you shoot seismic and you discover fields like they've discovered off of Brazil, which 
In 2011, President Obama was down there celebrating Brazil's development of those resources um, in the Atlantic. If we if we find discoveries like that, obviously there would be an interest to move forward and develop those resources. Okay. All right. And that, Thank you, guys. Just, just to make sure we understand, there are physical impacts on fisheries and marine life, and particularly marine mammals from seismic. So it's it's not just a decision about oil and gas potential, it's a decision also about do we want to take those impacts as part of seismic and each company needs their own data so you wind up with simultaneous or sequential seismic in the same area over and over again. Although each a seismic producer can shoot the seismic and sell it to multiple companies. So it's Perfect. not that everybody shoots their own seismic. Um, there there will be companies that will shoot multiple companies may shoot seismic, but but you're not going to have you know, if there's 15 producers like in the area, you're not going to have 15 companies shooting seismic. You're going to have maybe two. Just Correct. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you all. Um, the, now a question. I, what impact is this proposed oil and gas leasing plan likely to have on wind energy? And there could be a lot of facets here. Like, is, is space still available for wind energy? Um, just I, I'm curious to hear your your thoughts on this. Well, for here, for here in California, floating offshore wind, uh, which of course is conducted on devices that are very similar to floaters used by the oil and gas industry, and in many cases built by the same companies, floating offshore wind has elicited a fairly open mind by the conservation community, not speaking for every group, but uh, it's turning out that one of the companies that the draft proposed five-year OCS program credits or blames for the inclusion of California in the five-year oil and gas program is also the primary uh, interested party in offshore wind off of California. In fact, negotiating for offshore wind leases off of Humboldt County right now, and that's that oil. So as you have individual companies that have been moving into the offshore wind uh, industry, which is probably a good thing, uh, when we see them sort of segue into offshore oil and gas, gee, while we're there, uh, maybe we should drill. I, I think that's going to have a chilling effect on the offshore wind industry, especially off California. Okay, thank you, Richard. Okay. Tim? So I just to annoy. So I would add. So we represent a number of wind companies as well, and and see the the prospect of of increased oil and gas activity compatible, obviously in 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 almost all the regions with with wind. Um, and one of the benefits I think of of having both developments sort of in place is we do use a very much of the similar supply chain. Um, the Block Island, the Rhode Island project in Block Island, which built the first OCS wind farms in the United States. Uh, the many of the companies that built that are, are oil and gas companies, members of Noya, and and it's you know the same fabrication shops, the same towboats, the same um, industry that that builds the jackets and and other infrastructure for um, the wind industry that 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 conducts our oil and gas. And so having um, having potentially some of these areas doing both activities will provide greater supply chain. Uh, competition uh, amongst members, and and I would contend, you know, off of California, um, again, the floating wind is going to rely, you know, floating wind is going to rely on anchors um, to to stabilize it and keep in place, the same way that floating oil production facilities uh, in the Gulf of Mexico, deep water, uh, operate. Um, you know, and currently there are roughly four major anchor companies remaining in the, in the world right now, um, and and having you know, sort of both industries um, driving the development and the expansion of those, um, that industry sort of would create more opportunity and a better price point for everybody in the in the industry, so. But okay. if I were the, if I were advising industry on strategy, I would have uh, probably carefully siloed or segmented the offshore wind industry from the offshore oil and gas industry because I don't think that while they may be economically compatible from the standpoint of supply chain, in terms of public reception, for example, to offshore wind in California, which has a very strong policy about climate uh, mitigation, uh, I am afraid that we may throw the baby out with the bathwater on offshore wind if, if the industry pursues this combined strategy. 
Okay. I, Go ahead, Tim. I, I just, I, I mean, you have companies that have expertise working in, in the offshore space. And, and I, I, again, I, I, I struggle to understand why multiple arms of a company can't do multiple business strategies. Oh, no, I get um, it. I, I, I get why they're I, doing I, I just, it. <laughs> I mean, one of our members was was Ersted, which used to be Danish oil and gas, and and you know it's a company that had a long history of producing oil and gas in the offshore space. is now a wind company and, and one of the larger ones here in the United States. Um, you know, that's just they take their expertise and they move to the space to to create energy. So, and I think that's Data Oil's effort as well. So. Oh, I understand, and and I think some of the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management staff uh, in the Camarillo office uh, in California, in charge of the OCS uh, wind, are were pretty chagrined when they saw the five-year OCS oil and gas program because they knew that the entanglement of the two did not bode well for offshore wind, and it's just a policy judgment. But I think I would have tried to separate the two just in the public mind quite a bit more than has happened. Okay, thank you, thank you all. Um, I'm just gonna relay, let's see, a couple of um, comments that have come in, and this is back uh, pertaining to seismic. Um, there was sort of a question, but uh, but it's more of an admonition, I think. Uh, will the companies that get the permits to do seismic exploration, can we mandate that they share the information with the public? Uh, many scientists could also benefit from learning more about the resources. Um, so that was one comment and sounds like a great idea rather than having the seismic surveys repeated. So, uh, yeah, go ahead. Well, so a, so seismic companies were required to share the, the data with the government. Um, and so BOEM gets all of the seismic that is shot um, under, in, under permits um, that are issued. Um, it, it, it is, um, obviously it's not available to the public. It is a, you know, obviously it's a valuable piece of information of, of which people pay multiple millions of dollars for um, and and that's how the seismic companies you know make a living um, I, I certainly think that if the government were willing to pay to shoot the seismic that they could release it as a as a public um, process but I don't I, I mean at this point it's just not a it's not a public data piece um, due to the value of it yeah in many cases the geophysical companies do this on spec speculation just like a spec house builder builds a house and sells it so if a company is going to shoot seismic on spec, they're going to want to sell it in a proprietary basis. And I think that's one of the unfortunate things is this is what leads to multiple surveys in the same area. Uh, and it'd be interesting to see if there were some way to have seismic data become a uh, public trust resource, because it really is anyway. It's a public uh, trust resources that are being damaged by it, the fisheries are being damaged by it, and it'd be nice to have the public in the loop on access to the data. Oh, I was gonna say Senator Bingham in a, a number of years back had a proposal to um shoot um seismic uh, as a federal um effort and then making the data public um once upon a time. Obviously again that's the cost value of that is is that the best use of our federal dollars or not? Um, especially when you have, again, industry willing to pay for it um, themselves um, and BOEM. Well, BOEM, there is the a agency which is small so. uh, Then in the, UK, in the UK, the government departments have, size, have funded seismic surveys to allow all companies to access that data in an area during licensing rounds. So there is precedent for uh, that being a, fed, a national uh, undertaking. Um, but moving on, um, and we also got a comment from Boehm, um, somebody at Boehm through Twitter, uh, and I, but I think we've covered that, that seismic permitting is an independent process uh, than what's known as the draft program, and uh, the seismic permitting helps decide what areas to open. Okay, um, so we're going to move on, and I'm going to target the next question at Sarah. Um, and that is, what relationship, if any, does this new proposal for oil and gas leases have with the existing ocean plans for the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic? Um, <clears throat> yes, so um, thanks for that question. I wonder if it makes sense for just a minute to walk back um, to talk about coastal marine spatial planning as a management tool in case folks aren't 
fully aware of what's been happening on uh, in U.S. waters anyway. Does that make sense? Yes, like absolutely. That would be great. Yep, great. let's do that. Um, right. So coastal marine spatial planning is a management tool, um, and it's meant to look at the ocean and coasts um, and the activities that occur within them as an integrated ecosystem, right? And so by considering not just the resources and the wildlife that are there, but also the human footprint, which is what we're talking about today, right? We've talked about um, OCS, we've talked about, I'm sorry, we've talked about oil and gas drilling, we've talked about seismic, we've talked about wind, that there's a lot of things that are just happening in our waters. They are not wild frontier that we, that many take them for anymore. Um, so anyways, by considering the human footprint that, you know, we can better understand how we can be not just better managers of the ocean, but also stewards of those resources in reality, how we use and protect them. Um, so from the U.S. side, um, the U.S. has been using coastal and marine spatial planning for many years. Um, depending on where you are, it can be referred to as C um, coastal marine spatial planning, marine planning, or ocean planning. So I apologize if I use them interchangeably in my answer. Um, you know, they've it's been happening on both the state and regional level for many years. States like Massachusetts, Rhode Island, um, Washington all have developed plans for managing their state waters. The Mass Ocean Plan, the Rhode Island Special Area Management Plan, and the Washington um, Spatial Plan. Um, so over the last five years or so, um, several regions of the U.S. have started using um, ocean planning as a tool to better integrate, um, you know, consideration of our natural ecosystems into sort of the human use activities and how agencies and states and tribal nations make decisions around them. Um, so each region, and um, I'm probably going to focus on my answer just a little bit on the two that you have identified in your question. Um, which is the Northeast region um, and the Mid-Atlantic region. Um, so, you know, regions in the last several years have gotten together to say, you know, let's let's talk about how we can ensure government efficiency and things like common sense decision making and coordination between these entities that already have existing management authority over ocean and coastal resources and human activities in those spaces. Um, so some regions are further ahead in this planning work, um, and in 2016, um, the two regions out in front adopted the nation's first ever regional ocean plans, which are the two that you mentioned. Um, the Northeast region um, adopted their Northeast Ocean Plan. Um, the Northeast region is this um, body comprised of coastal states from Maine to Connecticut, plus Vermont. Um, six tribal nations and I believe nine federal agencies plus the New England Fishery Management Council. Um, and then the Mid-Atlantic region is comprised of uh, the states New York through Virginia plus Pennsylvania. Um, several tribal nations including the Pamunkey Indian Tribe and the Shinnecock Indian Nation plus um, eight federal agencies. Sorry, <laughs> I always get those confused. Um, and so they adopted at the same time the Mid-Atlantic Regional Ocean Action Plan. Um, and so I, this is, you know, sort of a long-winded answer, but um, I wanted to be able to sort of set the frame of what marine spatial planning has been in the in the Northeast and the Mid-Atlantic, particularly, um, to be able to um, sort of connect it to what we're talking about today. So, you know, in an overarching way, um, ocean planning serves as a complementary function to sort of the single species, single use laws that we have to manage our ocean and coastal resources. So instead of looking at species by species or use by use, ocean planning works to pull together um, those exact people that I mentioned, decision makers, tribal nations, and stakeholders to look at the ocean as an interwoven ecosystem and ask what do we want to see in our ocean and how can we work toward that together through cooperative actions. Um, and so that's what those regions did. And early on, they said, um, you know, we're going to set a vision for what we want the Northeast and the Mid-Atlantic to look like. And we're going to set goals to meet those, that vision and those principles. And, you know, neither region considered um, oil and gas at that time because it wasn't an issue. And so, you know, 
these plans look at sort of the state that they want the ocean to be in down the road um, and their goals focus around, you know, ensuring a healthy ocean and coastal ecosystem, um, advancing decision making through all of these different agencies and tribal nations and stakeholders, um, as well as um, 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 the third one is, oh, sustainable ocean uses. So they really look towards, you know, what are the uses that are happening or are emerging? And let's put our energy towards focusing on how do we ensure we collaborate and coordinate um, so that these uses um, that we want to see in our space are done well. Um, and so, you know, neither region explicitly um, deals with um, oil and gas um, because neither region expected um, or planned um, in particular. And so it's not so much that um, ocean planning is silent um, on this issue, but that you know this works within one sort of legal framework and the ocean plans try and take a much more broader and holistic view at sort of what their priorities are. Um, and when they set these goals and these plans um, that they adopted, um, that just wasn't one of them early on. That's okay. a really good answer. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Sarah. Um, did anyone else have anything they wanted to add? Well, I would just say that uh, I think the fact that ocean planning has been going forward in a coherent way without much controversy is, is really evidence that we we can all benefit from it. And I think it's wise to respect the will of coastal states. And I would remind all of our listeners, I think this is a good time to say that BOEM is holding a listening session in a state capital near you uh, between now and March 9th, the deadline for comments on the five-year program. And this is a form of marine spatial planning, whether we like it or not, uh, the OCS uh, five-year leasing program is sort of supersedes all of the coherent spatial planning that's been done thus far, including national marine sanctuaries that took decades to create. So I encourage all interested parties to participate in the public comment period. Uh, you can go to BOEM and search participation. It'll show you where those listening sessions are be to be held and then written comments are accepted uh, till March 9th. And we've had a number of uh, folks that ha have trouble with the regulations.gov website and having to go through three or four clicks in a search to comment. So we've set up a website called savethecoast.org, savethecoast.org. You can comment in any way you like, but that takes you directly to the proper place to comment, savethecoast.org. Okay, thank you, Richard. I want to back up from that a little bit and I have another question um, I actually have a bunch more questions but uh, looking at it now the potential for this uh, initial this draft plan to change um, I'm, I'm curious to get where people um, think the greatest changes are going to come from uh, now I read about one bill proposed by Senator Marco Rubio from Florida to extend the moratorium off the Gulf Coast of Florida um, it, do we? Do you think the biggest changes are going to come from congressional um, congressional work of, of putting on moratoriums on on different actions, um, or or lawsuits um, or public comment? And so I'm just curious. To, it's a really big, huge question, uh, but I'll, I'll throw that out there. And actually, Jay, are you? Uh, Jay, do you have any thoughts on this? Yeah. Um a few, you know, you, you identified correctly at the beginning, you talked about the litigious environment we're in, and I, and I sort of feel like that is the water we're all swimming in. You know, Congress is gridlocked. Uh, the administration is very um, bold, shall we say. I mean, this plan, like a lot of things, has this in-your-face character to it. Um, and so the question becomes, well, you know, can they do what they want to do? And I think that ultimately gets decided in, in court. Um, you know, they can say we want to flip the script from 90% everything, 90% off limits to 90% open to development, but that's not much of a principle by itself. Um, you can call that energy dominance, and maybe that's a principle, but it's, it's sort of a thin one, given what um, markets have already accomplished. 
But you know, to be fair to people who drafted the proposal, um, we know the administration isn't into incremental change. They don't feel bound by history or precedent or long-term thinking. They're, they're very transactional. So you know, this is this is their idea of a strong opening bid, and that's probably okay um, under Oxla. The secretary gets to balance a lot of different factors. You can kick off the process with whatever kind of rhetoric you want, but ultimately as I think the BOEM directors already had to testify in, in response to Zinke's uh, comments about Florida, ultimately the, the plan gets written um, and then it gets reviewed in court. And, and uh, I think the only problem with some of the rhetoric that's out there or having too freewheeling of a process is that that might get you in trouble at that stage, the judicial review stage, which is a separate question from what can they do and say now when everything's kind of bubbling up and you know comments are being considered and the plans being written. Okay, thank you, Jay. And I would suggest uh, you asked about Marco Rubio's legislation to extend the Gulf of Mexico Energy Security Act, which actually was put together mostly by Republicans. I was there. It was a bipartisan effort, but it was to protect a military mission line uh, where live fire exercises occur off the Gulf Coast and Panhandle of Florida, and it was negotiated in a way that it expires, uh, unless, re un unless renewed, it expires in 2022. So there's a great deal of concern, of course, that the five-year OCS leasing program as proposed is constructed in such a way as to open up that area to leasing uh, immediately. So Marco Rubio and others have legislation that would extend the duration of GOMESA primarily because of the military space use conflicts. Interesting. Okay. Thank you. Uh, it, just just for the record, though, I mean, uh, DOD has had a number of reports, and BOEM in their in their plan put out a pretty good, colorful map about what the uh, military impacts are, and we're expecting a DOD report in in March. But I mean, there's an awful lot of space in the eastern Gulf of Mexico that is not conflicted with DOD that that could be available for leasing, and and particularly. Um, when you get further out, um, I mean, obviously more than 125 or 130 miles from Florida, um, that's where the actual resources plays are. Um, and those areas are, are both well outside the military conflict areas as well as a long way away from Florida. So. Okay. And do any of you know of any other legislation other than the bill proposed by Marco Rubio um, for any moratoria? Well, I Francis believe... Rooney of, yeah. I believe there are other uh, members of both the House and the Senate. I think 12 senators have now signed a letter asking to opt out their states. Uh, there are there are moves afoot among the coastal states that feel slighted by the favoritism shown to Rick Scott in Florida that they want equal treatment. How that will translate uh, on the Hill, it's too soon to say. Uh, one of the things it's doing is it's clogging up the SECURE Act, as it's called, which would be tremendous incentives for states to accept offshore drilling, even if they don't want it, by giving them a share of the revenues. And that opens up a whole new can of worms that I don't think most states are falling for. And particularly, there's not enough votes in the House right now to move it. But, uh, you know, the efforts on both sides, I think, are aligning for, you know, uh, rolling over states on one hand and states exercising their legitimate authority on the other hand. I think both of those sides are, are arming themselves right now. Okay, thank you. Um, I'd point out, I think if anybody's on Twitter, that at OpenOcto, um, our, our Twitter account for Octo, I think Jade Clevinson from BOMA has been posting a lot of tweets uh, with information about um, uh, public comments and just on the on this webinar in general, if anybody wanted to go check that out. Um, okay, well, first of all, for all those of you who have to leave uh, after an hour, I wanted to say thank you so much. Um, if our panelists can stay a couple more minutes, I wanted to impose on you with one more question. Sure. Um, and that's about Hawaii and U.S. territories. Um, is there Are there plans for oil drilling out there? And uh, is there any discussion about oil drilling in the National Marine Sanctuaries and Marine National Monuments? How's, what's, what's going on in that sphere? It's not included in, in this draft plan. Um, and I, I don't didn't quite understand the background or why or why not. Well, others may have information beyond what I have, but in terms of marine national monuments, particularly in the Pacific, uh, there may be hard minerals resources, 
but generally the geology does not trend toward petroleum resources. Uh, as far as the Northeast Canyons and Seamounts, uh, that Marine National Monument does not appear to be on top of petroleum interested structures, but uh, is near enough to the historic industry interest in drilling on Georgia's bank that I think that's how Northeast Canyons and Seamounts wound up on the hit list and the executive order, so, uh, or the review list as it's called. And so I think Pacific other issues are at play such as removing any fisheries restrictions. And keep in mind, the Northwest Hawaiian Islands was done really by Laura Bush uh, at, at that time. But uh, the Pacific Fishery Management Council, uh, I mean, the Mid-Pacific mid, mid, mid Management Council, the Hawaiian Fishery Management Council has long been interested in making sure that monuments in the Pacific are not close to fishing. And they appear to be about to get their wish from some of the comments we've heard from the Secretary of Interior. Okay, did anyone have anything to add to that? Well, Sarah, not, not related to, to Hawaii or the Pacific, but the, the kind of the protected areas thread. Let me throw one more legal piece into the mix here. You mentioned at the top of the broadcast that um, Trump's executive order purported to reverse Obama's withdrawals back under OXLA, Section 12A, of of lands in the arctic and the atlantic canyon complexes along a lot of the, the east coast more than just the monument from leasing uh, and their theory is that the executive order immediately negated that and thus those blocks are back in the leasing plan but completely separate from what happens under the, the leasing process there's an open legal question and it's very similar to the one i was describing about the monuments as to whether Oxla allows those kind of reversals. Um, it's, it's almost completely parallel. The, the act gives language allowing the president to authorize the withdrawals. It says nothing about removing them. And so that too is going to get tested in court. Um, that suits up in Alaska, some environmental and indigenous groups sued there to stop the reversals. Um, API in the state of Alaska intervened to, to defend the Trump actions. And that's probably where that question gets decided. But that court case also has the potential to put some more holes into this, this current leasing plan and possibly resurrect some area-based protection. Okay, thank you, Jay. Were there any other points anyone wanted to have had a final thought about that they wanted to convey before we wrap up? I would just suggest that we've had, you know, a fairly orderly uh, discussion about a fairly orderly process and when you think about the oceans and all of the things that humans depend upon the oceans uh, you know for uh and the fact that we had a bipartisan consensus over well really extending from 1982 till 1990 a bipartisan consensus in congress and on the hill including republican presidents that certain areas were too sensitive and the resource potential in oil and gas was too low but the environmental sensitivity and economic productivity in a sustainable way was too high not to lease those areas. And so throwing this sort of series of legal impediments, if you will, to continued protection of the ocean. I mean, one of the things we missed discussing, and we can probably do a whole other webinar on it someday, is the way in which the executive order in April 28th makes it almost impossible, if not extremely difficult, to make any new National Marine Sanctuary designations, even through the National Marine Sanctuary Act legitimate process. I mean, we're seeing a rollback of the laws that protect America's oceans pretty much wholesale across the board. And I don't think the American public, from what I can tell, is anywhere near ready for that. And I don't think the industry benefits from it because it makes the issues surrounding ocean management so much more contentious. And I would suggest that we, we had a pretty good thing going. Uh, as we realized that we had a new administration, but that doesn't really justify blowing up, you know, the way in which historically in Republicans and Democrats have figured out how to manage the ocean. It's not easy on the best of days, but it's no need to make it impossible, which I think the administration has now done. Okay, thank you, Richard. And I'd yeah. just like, Gabe, I'd just like to close. I'd, 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 
don't disagree. I'm going to say I don't disagree with Richard right here, which I know everybody on the phone is going to be totally shocked. But I, I would certainly prefer to spend a lot less time talking about um, sanctuaries and focus on areas where um, that that have not been obviously had the same level of protection, but that have resources which are um, available to benefit the American people. And, and one of the things that I just wanted to touch on is, again, you know, so much of of what we look at with this sort of stuff is is regional. And as I highlighted earlier, right, California, which currently gets 55% of its oil from foreign sources, um, you know, the, the ability to produce offshore, um, because they're not able to take advantage of the, the boom in American production, um, there's just not pipeline or rail capacity to bring the, the Permian or the Bakken oil to California. Um, whereas, you know, producing offshore, um, where we know there have historically been large resources, um, that have been produced for for decades, um, being able to go back and produce that so that Californians can benefit from it and reduce that foreign dependence is something that you know I think is is absolutely critical and something that we should you know as you look at balancing this sort of stuff um, and and where that money again where that money is going and, and not going um, you know the the roughly five billion that was spent on Saudi Arabian oil in 2016 by the people of California could certainly be reinvested into. Um, California itself, and then the the other dynamic is is on the North Atlantic. Um, just roughly, I don't know, ten days or so ago, a tanker of uh, Russian LNG was offloaded into the Boston Harbor LNG terminal um, because the resources, again, the pipelines and the infrastructure to bring LNG to the or to bring natural gas to the to the Northeast isn't there. And developing those resources in the OCS and and producing it. Um, again, off off of our onshores rather than shipping it in from from foreign countries is a much better uh, dynamic. So, um, it, again, it's not oil or no oil or gas or no gas. It's it's where are we getting it from? And and I think our our goal and our hope would be to bring it and produce it from the United States rather than other places. Okay, thank you, Tim. Uh, and we're going to wrap up uh, with that. Thank you. You guys were as good as I thought you would be as panelists, all of you. So um, I really appreciate you taking the time to do this and to speak um, to all of us and share your expertise in this area. So we really, really appreciate it. Um, and we're getting comments uh, saying thanks for the excellent discussion. Um, so thank you again, and I hope you, and, and thank you to everyone who was able to attend and, and stick through to, with the extra minutes. Um, we really appreciate your attendance, and uh, thank you, everyone, and have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all.